So a question I want to ask you this morning is, are you genuinely gentle? Are you <clears throat> genuinely gentle? And, and that question is, is one that, you know, I just got to be honest. As we looked at the fruit of the Spirit, I was not too excited to preach on kindness, goodness, and gentleness. I wasn't too excited to preach on those things. I was like, you know, we, we, we're that, right? Aren't we all that? Like, yeah, I'm a kind person. Are you a kind person? I, I'm, I'm a good person. Are you a good person? We're gentle. And actually, it's the words I wasn't excited to preach on that hit me the most. And, and I'm excited to share this with you this morning because the definition of gentleness is one that we all need. It's one that we all appreciate. And it's one that Jesus calls us to be. So we're going to talk about what that word means. And why are we talking about gentleness? Because gentleness is rare in our culture. Can I get an amen? Amen right? <clears throat> gentleness is rare in our culture, and when you are gentle, lives are impacted. See, God's Word is going to speak to it. It's going to show us. It's going to help us see it that when we are gentle, lives are impacted. At Thrive Church, we want to impact lives. I believe you want to live for a purpose greater than you as well. Like, more than just who you are, you want to invest in something bigger than you, eternal, in fact. And so investing in something internal is what happens when we are gentle. <coughs> Excuse me. So as we move forward, <clears throat> as we move forward here, what we're going to look at is, is how we're gentle when we walk by the Spirit. When we walk by the Spirit. And this is our theme verse as we've been going through this. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You see, when I'm talking about being gentle, and, and there's, there's a part of me that doesn't want to be gentle. Let, let, let me explain it this way. I've heard it a lot, and maybe you have. People are idiots. I mean, I hear it a lot. I hear people like, people are idiots. People are idiots. People, and you hear it a lot. Now, if I'm honest, if I'm honest, and I want to be real, right? I think that sometimes. <coughs> if I'm honest, sometimes, once in a while, I'll say it. Probably shouldn't say it. Because a gentle person, a gentle person is somebody who says, you know what? I, I recognize I want to walk by the Spirit, and I don't want to walk in my flesh, right? My fleshy desire says, don't be gentle. Don't be kind. Don't be good. But the question is, would Jesus, and if I'm walking by the Spirit, I'm walking like Jesus, would Jesus be a person who says people are idiots? Answer? Oh, come on, guys. Would Jesus say people are idiots? Answer? That was a little scary, but that was a lot better the second time, right? We would say Jesus probably wouldn't say that. Jesus would not say that because part of what Jesus is is he is gentle. He is gentle. We're going to look at how gentle he was and how we can be like him. Because when I'm walking in the Spirit, in Galatians 5.22, I'm actually producing the fruit of the Spirit. The, the Holy Spirit comes into me. So, so listen, there's, there's a line you cross at Thrive Church. We believe there's unbelief and there's belief. There, there's a point of people in this room that you, know, you haven't put your faith in Jesus yet. You haven't made that your decision. It's not who you are. You haven't defined yourself yet to say that I put my faith in God. But when you step across that line of, of, of unbelief to belief, you, you're, you're believing that Jesus died on the cross for your sin. You're believing that, that you confess all your brokenness to him and he forgives you and you believe that Jesus is the son of God and he raised him from the dead three days later and you believe that I'm gonna surrender my life and live the Bible out in who I am. <clears throat> when you step across that into the point of faith, you receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes into you and, and the Holy Spirit does a work in you, starts to change you from the way you used to be to the way God wants you to be now. And that Holy Spirit producing fruit produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The Holy Spirit starts to produce these things in you. And like we said, that word gentleness, it's rare in our culture today. It is rare in our culture today. We live in a culture today that wants to scream at people that disagree with us. We, we live in a culture today that's angry about everything. We live in a culture today that says people are all idiots, 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 idiots. And it's like, hold on, guys, hold on. Let's see what God wants to do with his followers. Let's see how he calls us to live. He wants us to be gentle. The definition of gentle is actually pretty simple. If you're taking notes, I encourage you to take notes. And the chair back's in front of you. You'll see there's a little note paper in there. You can pull that out. That's right there with the pens. And you can actually pull out the note paper, and you can write this definition down. You can write this definition down on this note paper. So I encourage you, take notes as we talk about this relevant topic. The word gentleness, it actually means the ability to correct without harshness, to treat with tenderness and kindness. That's what the Holy Spirit produces in me. It produces the ability to correct without harshness. Wow, that's interesting. Gentleness is in the area of correction. 
Gentleness is in the area of correction, to come alongside somebody and to say, hey, there's something here that you can probably do a better way. There's something here that I can help correct. There's something here that needs to change because if we don't correct it now, later in life, it's going to be a big what? It's going to be a big problem. And so we look at gentleness, and it's all about the ability to correct without harshness, to say, I'm going to be tender, and I'm going to be kind. I'm going to be tender, and I'm going to be kind. And you're like, well, we're all church folk, right? We're all church folk. We go to church. We're here. We love each other. We're tender and kind. Uh -uh. (laughs) Uh-uh. It's interesting, Old Te- or in the New Testament here, the book of Galatians, what is being said, Paul was writing this verse, walk in the spirit and you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. You know the verse that came right before that? This is what he said in Galatians 5, 15, and 16. He says, but if you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out, exclamation mark, beware of destroying one another. So I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desire of the flesh. Isn't it interesting that the church is being warned, hey, quit biting and devouring each other. Quit biting and devouring each other. We do it with our words. We do it with our attitudes. We do it with our actions. We walk in. We're not gentle with each other, right? These are Christians interacting with Christians. Stop biting and devouring each other. Walk by the Spirit. Have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We're supposed to have gentleness in how we interact with each other. And it would be nice to think, man, we don't ever hurt each other. But the reality is we, we do. We hurt each other in the church. And we also, in society, we live in a society where people hurt each other. And when God came and Jesus came down to earth, God sent Jesus' his son to earth. And Jesus looked at the society. He looked at civilization. He looked at the people. Here's what he felt as he looked at them. In Matthew 9, verse 35, the passage says, Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. And when he saw the crowds, he had what? Compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. They were confused and helpless. And Jesus is looking at his creation. He's looking at mankind who he created. And he's looking at people. He's like, man, my heart breaks for them. That's what it means to have compassion, to, to feel it in your gut. Like you just have that, that knot in your gut. You're like, man, I just feel this thing. It's in my gut. It's like, man, I hurt for them. They're, they're confused. They're lost. They're like sheep without a shepherd. He had compassion. And out of that compassion came gentleness, correction without harshness, tenderness, kindness. That's what came out of him, a gentleness that allows him and it also allows us to properly handle all types of people we meet in life. You might be sitting here and it's like, This is really good to hear. I agree with everything, but I got to tell you the truth. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't be a gentle person. I don't know how to be gentle. I don't know how to do this. This is all a great idea. But pastor, I'm just going to tell you now, it's not me. Well, I got hope for you. It's not about you doing it. It's about the Holy Spirit doing it in you. It's a supernatural characteristic, a quality that has been given you by the Holy Spirit. When you step from unbelief to belief and you receive the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit comes in and says, listen, I'm going to start to produce in you God's type of gentleness. I'm going to start to produce in you God's type of gentleness. And again, looking at Jesus' life, it's a great way to understand it in in, in flesh because that's who Jesus was. He was God with flesh on. And so looking at Jesus' life in Matthew chapter 12, verses 15 to 21, they're describing Jesus. They're talking about Jesus. And there's a prophecy in the Old Testament written about Jesus who's going to come in the New Testament. And part of the way to say, hey, when you see this, he's here. When you see this, it's the one. When you see the Messiah, here's what you're going to see in verse 18. Here is my servant whom I have chosen. The one I love and in whom I have delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. And a smoldering wick he will not snuff out till he leads justice to victory. In his name, the nations will put their hope. You see, I believe that Jesus came to deal gently with people. I believe Jesus came to deal gently with people. And there in the bold part of verse 20, it says that he's a bruised reed he will not break. (coughs) A bruised reed he will not break, meaning he's not going to run people over. He's not going to run people over. Have you ever felt run over in life? Have you ever felt somebody just mowed you down, didn't care about your feelings, didn't care about you, didn't care about what you thought, didn't care if you had an opinion or not? They just came in and they just mowed you down. 
A bruised reed he will not break. It's kind of like cattails. Have you ever seen cattails around a lake? You know, you go by a creek or a lake or a swamp, and you see these cattails growing. Like, they're, they're wide blades of grass, kind of, and they grow pretty tall, right? They're like cattails. And that's kind of a reed that they would have pictured back then. And then there's another type of reed in the Middle East as well. It would be like a bamboo shoot. A, a bamboo shoot that they, like, make flutes out of and they play music out of. it. Like, a bruised reed, something very small, insignificant, that doesn't really matter. A bruised reed he will not break. And it goes on to say that a smoldering wick he won't snuff out. And in that culture, they would have had, like, pots that they had, like, oil lamps in. It kind of shaped, like, the Aladdin pot, you know, in, in the Disney movie. And, like, they put a little wick in there, and they would light it on fire. And that would be where they get their source of light through the, through the night. And, and these wicks would start to get old. They would start to get small. They would start to wear out. And they would sit there, and they would sputter and cough and puff. And they'd go from an amber back to a flame and back to an amber and back to a flame. And he's saying Jesus would, he would be able to take that, that, that wick and not extinguish its flame. That's how gentle, and that's how kind he is. That's how they knew he was Jesus, and he was the one. And so can I step you through some, some processes of how I think we can have Jesus' gentleness in our life? Here's a process that I think we can show that we have gentleness as we deal with people like Jesus would deal with them. I think number one, I think Jesus would say to somebody, I see you. I see you. You're not invisible. You're not off in the corner unknown. You're, you're, you're not hiding. I see you. I see who you are. And in fact, Jesus, he created us. And he knows who we are. And so I think Jesus would say to his creation, I, I see you. And then next, I think he would say, I, I recognize your pain. As you see people and you want to be gentle with them, number one, just say, hey, I just want you to know, but I, I see you, right? And I recognize your pain. A lot of hurting people, broken reeds, right? The wick that's about to go out. There's not much left. I'm going to give up hope. You don't understand this burden I'm carrying. Well, number one, I see you. And number two, I recognize your pain. And you can speak that to him and say, I identify you're hurting. You're broken, right? I see that. And I care about you is the next thing. I, I care about you. And I'm willing to listen. Have you ever asked a hurting person, you said, I see you? I recognize your pain. I care about you, and I'm willing to listen. Have you ever asked to listen to somebody? Have you ever gotten the privilege to hear them share their soul with you? The privilege to, to hear them open up and say, really deep down inside, I feel this way. I feel unseen. I feel insignificant. I feel like I don't matter. I feel like, and, and they just dump their hurt out because you were enough, you were there enough to care. And you were there enough to recognize them. You were there enough to say, I care about you. I see the pain you're in, and then you listen, and you get to receive their hurt, and you're gentle. You're correcting without harshness. You're tender. You're caring. That's what the word gentleness means, and I think that's how Jesus interacted with people, and as the church, we're called to have that fruit of the Spirit, that gentleness. And so after you see them, you recognize the pain, you, you listen, you tell them that they, you do care, and then you say this, I would like to share something with you. I would like to share with you a, a better way. Can, can I share a Jesus way with you? You see, when you walk beside somebody in gentleness and you listen, you take the time and you get to know them and you earn their trust and then they say, I'm willing to listen to what you have to say. You're not shouting at me. You're not screaming at me. You're not holding signs that says that God hates me. You're, you're not doing, you're actually caring and coming alongside and you're walking beside. You're not running them over. But instead you're dealing with them with gentleness with gentleness. You're showing them a Jesus way. Guys, I believe that the Holy Spirit is in us, and that way we're, we're able to be Jesus to people. And I believe that when Jesus is near, no one is beyond hope. I believe when Jesus is near, no one is beyond hope, no matter how hopeless the situation. If you're able to have the Holy Spirit in you, and you're able to say, I see you, I recognize your pain, I hear you, I want to care, I'll listen. Can I share with you a better way? You can bring hope to any broken situation. Listen, Jesus knows how to deal with people. Jesus knows how to deal with people. This next slide, you look at the picture up there. Jesus knew how to handle people. I'm like, what? <clears throat> I just got to say this. People are bananas. Now, I didn't say you act like bananas or you go bananas. I said you are a banana. <clears throat> You're a banana and I'm a banana. 
You ever buy bananas at the store and you pick like a really good looking bunch of bananas? You're like they're, they're not messed up and they're pretty good. And like I, I pick that one and put it in the bag and you wait at checkout now that we're checking all our groceries out and you're like we're doing the work at the store, right? So you ring up your produce, you total it, you put it in the bag, you take it home. And like you're taking the bag out, you put it in the back of the car and like the bag falls over and, it, and stuff falls on the bananas. And like and your kids offer to help bring the bag in from the grocery store and they're bringing the bag in and the bananas are all over the floor. They're falling. And, they're, and then like you look at it and you finally get the bananas home and you're like, I picked a really nice bunch of bananas, and by the time they get home, like, they're all beat up and bruised. You see, bananas get bruised easily on the outside. They bruise, they mark, they turn brown, and they also get bruised easily on the what? Inside. People are bananas. I, I get easily hurt on the outside, right? It might be a physical pain, it might be an arm break, it might be a back pull, might, like, we get hurt on the outside, but also we get hurt on the inside, the way people talk to us, talk at us, talk about us, opinions and attitudes and things that are said and we're overlooked and people don't care to sit down and hear our story and walk beside us and be gentle with us. And we go through life as bananas. We get beat up. We get bruised. We carry marks. There's marks inside. There's marks outside. And that's the person that Jesus came to care for because Jesus knows how to handle people and he knows that we're bananas. He knows that we break easy, we hurt easy, we bruise easy, and that's who we are. He says, I'm going to come along beside you, and I'm going to be gentle with you. Remember, the word gentle is correction without harshness. See, that word correction is tied to another word Jesus said he was. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And being the truth means I come to correct and speak truth to you. And he came to speak truth in a gentle way, in a kind way, in a loving way. And he came to show that to people. I believe Paul put gentleness in the fruit of the Spirit because he understood if we're going to be Christ-like, if the Holy Spirit's going to be in us and changing us and we're genuine Christ followers, if that's happening and that's true, we have to be gentle because we're speaking the truth with gentleness. As a church, we stand for the truth with gentleness. Yes, we have truth. Yes, truth is firm. Yes, truth is unmovable. But with that truth, we're called to be gentle. We're called to be gentle. Look at what Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3.15 on the slide behind me. He's writing this. He says, so that if I am delayed, Paul was coming to the church and he was going to share with the church. He's like, if I'm delayed, you will know how people must conduct themselves in the household of God. This is the church of the living God, which is the what? Pillar and foundation of truth. Paul sees the church and says, church, you are the pillar of truth. Upon the church, the word of God comes, and the word of God is the truth that we stand for, and the foundation God gives us cannot be shaken. And so there's this pillar of truth, and that's what the church is called to be. Magnificent, supporting the weight, standing up for what matters, teaching and proclaiming the truth of the word of God. You are the pillar of truth. That's the church's responsibility. And, and as Paul is writing this, he's writing it from Macedonia. And, and if you've ever seen pictures from the Middle East, pictures from the Bible lands, pictures of what the towns look like now, here's the city that Paul wrote this verse in. The city of Macedonia, he would have written in the first century AD, but today we look at it and what do you see in the picture behind me? There's pillars. And those pillars are still what? Standing. Standing. 2,000 years later. Listen, we understand those pillars still stand. They were built structurally to hold up the building. The roof has fallen. The, the, the rafters have fallen. The sides of the walls have fallen. But that pillar is still there. As the church of God, 2,000 years later, we're still called to be the pillar. And, and when Paul wrote this letter to Timothy, the church was only decades old. Only decades old. It was a young movement of people called out, following God, identifying as the followers of the way, Christians, little Christ. And in this church that Paul was writing to, that he had planted and he's coaching, listen, it was a fragile church. It was a sinful church. It was a divided church. It was a persecuted church. It was an afflicted church. It really was far from any idea of having the structural integrity and strength that it needed to have. It was struggling in it, but Paul said, you are the church, you are the pillar of truth, you have these things, because God intended from the beginning to make the weak and wandering church his stage for his divine plan. Guys, today we are speaking truth to the world, and we're called to speak it with gentleness. 
Today, we are representing the truth that Jesus died on the cross for, being the way, the truth, and the life, and we're supposed to do it with gentleness. Paul later writes to the church in 2 Corinthians 5.20, he says, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. I'm the pillar of truth. I'm representing the truth of God's word. I'm sharing the message of the gospel. I'm being Christ's ambassador. And I'm saying, hey, the world, you guys need to be reconciled to God. But what's the tone I'm saying it in? What's the feeling I'm using as I'm explaining that truth? Answer, gentleness. Gentleness, a pillar of truth. The church handles truth and handles people with gentleness, with love, with compassion, As Christ's ambassadors, this is the message that we are to share. Throughout all the generations, God has made his church, the wobbling, stumbling, spreading, and prevailing church, the keeper and messenger of truth. That's you and that's me. That's you and that's me. And as I prepared for this message this week, I came across this quote I wanted to share with you. The pillar doesn't rise or fall just with the... Oh. But with the... Ordinary people in ordinary pews. Guys, as the church, we're all equal. We're the same. Like, I'm the preacher. I'm preaching and sharing with you this morning. But guys, guess what? You are the pillar of truth. You are that Christ follower. You are the Christ ambassador. You are the one who's supposed to be engaging the world with gentleness. Correction without harshness. Tenderness. Kindness. You are the one who is supposed to handle truth with gentleness. And it's the church, the body of believers, it's the ordinary people, it's you and me, all of us together, living out this gentleness in our life. And Christ is using each one of us as his gentle ambassador to share the truth in love. To say, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. To, to, To be a reconciler of the world. And so God says to you, you're supposed to be gentle with everyone that you encounter. Yep, ordinary people, be gentle with them. Be gentle with them. But what about the broken people? Yep, be gentle with them also. Be gentle with broken people. Oh, what about people who have stumbled and fallen? Like, you know, they messed up, right? It's their problem. It's their fault. They brought it upon their own head, right? What are you supposed to be with those? Be gentle. Correct with kindness. What about people who don't know Jesus? What about people who deny Jesus? What about people who who don't love Jesus? But be be gentle with them too. Every person deserves gentleness. Jesus knew how to handle people. People were bananas. They bruise easy on the inside and the outside. The Holy Spirit comes and says, people says, I can't be gentle. The Holy Spirit comes and says, you can be gentle by a supernatural characteristic. You can use the gentleness God gives you. And some of us here might say, God, give me more gentleness. Some of us here need to repent and say, God, I've not been gentle, but I need to start being gentle today. Now, now, can I step over to the side and move from preaching God's word and just share a little bit of my heart with you today? I believe we stop being gentle when we start to be afraid, when we start to panic, when we start to feel like we're not in control anymore. I believe that's when we start to not be gentle. I need to take control back. I need to get the job done. This thing isn't working the way I want it to work. Therefore, I'm going to mow people over. I'm going to snuff those wicks, the candles that are going out. I'm not going to be gentle to people because, listen, it's on me to do what needs to be done, and I'm doing it now. That's kind of the culture we live in. It's kind of the culture we live in. We're not being gentle with each other. We revert to the bite and devour mode of living. Bite and devour, bite and devour. Get out of my way. You're a problem. I'm running over you. See, that's not what gentle people do. And here we are in a culture. We're in a culture where we're being stirred up and spoken to and says, things are a mess today. There's huge problems in our country and in our government. And there's big issues and big things we're wrestling with. And we just need to take charge and we need to not be gentle anymore. Guys, the church is the pillar of truth. The word of God is on the foundation he's given us that holds up that truth. And I just want to say today, we're living in a time where the church is is in this back and forth world where things are just going back and forth, back and forth. And and we're in a political season 
where you're hearing things and we're saying things that the, the Democratic Party is the pillar of truth and it will be our structure of truth for our society. The Republican Party is our pillar of truth and it will be the structure of truth for our society. And we have to fight for and champion and take control and we're panicking, we're afraid and we don't know what's going to happen. And What if my party doesn't win? And what if the other party? And what if? And what if? And what if? And we're living in a world of just chaos, confusion, and fear. Fearful people are not gentle people. The church should be able to understand that we have a foundation that can't be shaken. The church should be able to understand the word of God is the truth that we live upon. Sometimes we flip-flop our priorities. So sometimes we, we build things in that really aren't there. Sometimes we, we think that, well, the Constitution is just an extension of the Bible, right? Actually, no, it's not. The Bible is true all around the world, not just in America. It's not just an American thing. It's not just what we're supposed to worship, the Constitution and the amendments and the Bill of Rights. Like We, we, we get confused sometimes. And then in that, we get confused and we get fearful and we get anxious and we worry and we're not gentle with each other. We want to shout at each other. We want to tell each other what to do. We want to bite and devour and that's why I think this passage is so important for today. Here we come, like, listen, the, the ads and the campaigns, like, they're all over. YouTube, if you're watching videos, or Facebook, if you're scrolling, or social media, or the TV airways, like, every show, like, the commercial comes, like, political campaign, political campaign, political campaign. And I'm just asking, are they gentle commercials? Are they gentle? What are they doing? Name calling and saying this person and that person and this isn't true and that's not true. And we're living in this world. So as a church, this is when we step up and stand out and say that this pillar at this church represents God. This pillar at this church, we declare the gospel. It is not a political gospel. It is not a governmental gospel. It is the gospel, the word of God that goes around the world that every human being from every nation needs to hear and respond to. We're called to be gentle. We're called to be gentle in this way. Guys, these words matter. How we live matters. People are watching you. People are watching me. They're seeing something that either draws us towards God or drives us away from him. I believe gentle Christians that have the fruit of the Spirit in them engage their world in such a way the world wants to know more about you. You're unique. You're different. You are gentle with ordinary people, with broken people, and with people who stumble and fall, and people who don't even know Jesus. You're gentle with everyone because the Holy Spirit is producing that in you. If we need to confess and say we're, 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 we got off track and we're confused and we're broken and we're fighting for the wrong kingdom, we're waving the wrong flag, maybe now's the time to do it because it's going to get worse and worse and worse the closer we get to November. It's going to get crazier and crazier and crazier the closer we get. Our message, our goal is I'm Christ's ambassador. I'm not fighting for a political candidate. I'm not fighting for a party. I'm not fighting for a name. I'm Christ's ambassador. I will vote. I have no problem voting. I'm a citizen of America, but first I'm a citizen of heaven. And so I'll do my duty to vote. We should as a church do our duty to vote, but who we're fighting for and how we're living is all connected to Jesus. It's all connected to Jesus. Well, I have my friend Kevin who's going to come up here with me. And Kevin is new to Thrive, checking us out and getting to know us. Kevin is one of the missionaries that we support. His ministry is in France, and he came to kind of get to know our church. And, and so we talked American problems. I'm glad French people don't have any problems. Not at all. No, no political problems and crises or anything like that. But uh, Kevin, you're up here. And I just wondered, are French people bananas? Yeah, I would say that... <laughs> My way to answer that question is French people maybe are green bananas. <laughs> they come across a little bit tougher on the exterior. But the truth is they bruise as well. And, and, and when I'm telling them about Jesus or trying to present the gospel in a place that's really hard against the gospel in a different way than you would see around here, I have to be really careful to, to say all those things with love and gentleness and kindness or else I'm not hurt at all. I think something unique about our, our Bible that we read is you, you lived in America for about half your life mm -hmm. in Georgia, and you were a band teacher and, yeah. and director, and then God called you into the mission field, and so you went to France. So now you've been in two cultures. Right. And, and sometimes we think, well, is the Bible the same in both? Does it speak to the same needs and the same brokenness in both cultures? How have you seen the Word of God speak the same in both cultures? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I've had the, the privilege to be able to teach the Bible a lot in France, here in the States, in, in, uh, in Africa, in a couple of different countries. And it, it's really the common thread through all of that is this world is full of sinners. And we're all, we're all of us are sinners, and we all need Jesus. That's the, that's, the, that's the common, the universality of the gospel. I say that right. We all need Jesus. And so when I'm speaking to French people about the gospel, you know, it's offensive to say 
you know, you're not perfect. You're a sinner. Don't usually use that word because they don't even know what it means. But to, to say that you know, you've got things that you need to repent for, you've got things that, that if you stood before God, you wouldn't be excited about. And to, and to realize that Jesus, it's okay that you're not perfect because Jesus died for those sins. Jesus has paid the price. He's made a way for us to be reconciled to God. And that's the universality of the gospel is that all of us need Jesus, all of us. Mm -hmm. And in France, you shared a story, first service, what it's like when a lot of times you share with somebody who doesn't know Jesus, like your reaction and your response, and how, how do you handle that with gentleness? Like, how have you learned to, like, come alongside and not mow people over, but help ask questions coming alongside them? Right. Well, when I, um, when I talk with people about God, the, the, I usually, you have to start r real simple and, and say, you know, well, do you believe that there's any kind of God? And, and frankly, most of the people I talk to by big majority think that there's some God out there. They say, well, I, I, I think there's probably something there. There might be some force, some being that created, you know, but I don't, I don't think that God could be like he is in the Bible. I don't think God could, you know, this rule I don't think makes any sense, and I don't like this rule, and, and I don't like this rule. This, this seems mean that God would be this or arbitrary. And I said, well, okay, but... See, the thing is, if you tell me that God doesn't exist at all, well, that's a conversation we can have. I would say he does. You would say he doesn't. We can agree to disagree. It's fine. But if we both say, well, there's a God that exists, then it's our job. Like, he is who he is. So my, my wife's not sitting here right now, but, but I use her a lot as an example when I, when I talk about this. If you say, you know, she's, uh, your wife's terrific. And I would say, yes, you're right. My wife is terrific. And I just met her and she, she's six foot three and blonde and speaks Swedish and plays tennis. And I, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's not my wife. She's about this tall brunette, speaks French better than I do and doesn't speak. <laughs> but that's, this person you're talking about is not my wife. But she is, no, I think that your wife ought to be, it makes more sense for me if your wife is six foot three and speaks Swedish. It doesn't matter. It's not who my wife is. <laughs> It's the same thing with God. God's a person. God is who he is. And so gently to try to talk to these people and say, you know, if we both agree that God exists, then we got to figure out who he is. We don't get to decide who he is any more than we get to decide who each other are. We have to deal with and learn to learn the person that's in front of us. So that's kind of the way we approach that. Yeah, that's great. The conversation and with gentleness and asking questions and, you know, not mowing people over. I think that's great. And we can all learn from how we can all share Christ better in that way. So I thought it was a great illustration for us to, to hear. And like, as you talk to people, here's how to come alongside gently mm -hmm. in that way. So, Kevin, you're part of a church that has grown in France, yeah. and you planted four campuses, kind of like what our church is dreaming. We're ready for our first campus to, to launch, and you've seen it. How can we be praying for your church, and how can we be praying for you? Well, thanks. Well, I'll start with the personal one. So, I actually, when this service is over, my wife and I are going to get in the car and drive about 18 hours down to the Gulf Coast to my son's, because we're going to be grandparents in about a week. So, we're waiting. We're on baby watch. Yeah. So, thank you. Um, so, uh, yeah, excited about that. I be praying for that. And the, in terms of the church, you know, God has really blessed us over the last decade, really. We've been planning the church for, for a while, about every two or three years. And now we're in a place where we've asked some of the leaders, okay, what, what's your problems now? What is the next thing we need to tackle? And they said, well, we need to train the next group of leaders, you know, the, the elders and the, the, the pastors that came and started each one of these campus churches, you know, we, we, need to, we need to train the next ones. If we're going to grow, if we're going to continue, we need the next group of leaders to step up. And we aren't sure how to do that and aren't sure how to train them. And how. So we've instituted uh, a training, an 18-month-long training for lay leaders to come in um, and learn. You know, people that might be youth leaders, might, be, might learn to be elders, might be deacons, might serve this or that. But they'll, they'll come in. Some of them come from other church backgrounds. A lot of them are new Christians. And to, to fundamentally train them to be good gospel-led leaders. So there's Bible study, there's, there's, there's theology study, there's all these different classes, leadership study, church history, what it means to be a charist church as opposed to, and to train these leaders. So we've got, and this is the thing I'm most excited about that we're doing in ministry right now. We've got five charist churches plugging into this. 80 different lay leaders come and wow. meet and are signed up for this program, 18 months long, like it's homework and the whole nine yards. Um, and I don't, this is new. We've just started this, been about, we're about four months into it. Um, but I'm excited to see what fruit uh, God is going to produce from training these leaders to be the next group to come and, and, and lead in our churches. That is awesome. That is awesome. When you leave, 
you're going to get a bookmark. So when you leave or share your bookmarks, the bookmarks will be passed out to you. And on the back of the bookmark, there's a QR code, and that takes you to a video, three-minute video that helps explain what you're doing, what's happening, and then you'll be able to know more about Kevin and Cheryl's story, and you'll be able to know how to pray for them. And as a church, we're excited to invest in other churches that are being planted all around the world. And we're so excited to see this happening. It's happening in Africa, it's happening in Europe, it's happening in Asia and South America. There, there's there's Char Karis churches, the, the, the people that we work with, our sister churches, and there's incredible things happening. And so it's our privilege to hear Kevin share a bit, to meet you today, and to be able to hear a story, be able to pray for him in that way. And, and the grandchild is a girl, grand girl, girl. grand baby. So we're excited about a uh, uh, granddaughter being born. Will you pray with me as I pray for Kevin? Father, we, we just thank you for what Kevin has shared. We thank you for your calling upon his life, that he was faithful to say, God, I'll go where you want me to go. And Lord, you've used him and his wife to be a part of the ministry in France and investing and growing and, and raising up leaders. Father, I pray that the church in France will just continue to reach broken, hurting people, Reach people that are, that are ordinary people. Re reach people that have stumbled and have fallen, but they reach them with gentleness. Um, Lord, we pray for just uh, the, the seed of the gospel to be spread in soil and that it's watered and that you would cause it to grow and the church would continue to see that growth. We, we pray for the leaders that are being trained, the, the next generation that's going to come up and continue this work, the mission to be the, the pillar and foundation of truth that you have called the church to be. Father, we pray for uh, his son and his, his, uh, uh, his uh, daughter-in-law. We pray for the baby that's going to be born, born here shortly and for a smooth delivery and for the celebration that they get to see their, their family grow and for the blessing that children are from the Lord. Uh, Father, we, we just celebrate that with him in this time and we pray for safety as he travels down uh, right after service. Lord, thank you for being a good God that knows what we need, that knows where we're at and calls us gently to follow. God, thank you for working in each one of us. And we might say we can't be gentle, but your spirit in us says that we are because you are with us. God, help us to lean into you, to trust you, to follow you in how we're being gentle and in how we're making a difference, correcting people without harshness, being tender and kind and caring as we do that. We praise you in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.